Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to part two of our lecture on section 6.3, Reactions, Revolutions, and Reform from 1815 to 1848. Uh, now that we have explored all those various isms, liberalism, nationalism, even a bit of socialism, and of course, conservatism in the previous section, we can now dive in and explore some of the exciting political events that define this period. So first, we're going to look at a series of uprisings and revolutions that occur in the 18-teens and 1820s. Not many of these are going to be very successful because, as we know, the Concert of Europe was very effective at maintaining that conservative status quo in those years immediately following the Congress of Vienna. But still, it's worth exploring some of these, um, some of these events. Starting with Italy. So... Um, Italy saw many uprisings, and uh, one of the most notable uprisings took place over about 1820 and 1821, and it was led by a group called the Carbonari. Now, just to remind you, the Congress of Vienna had actually established nine separate states in Italy, all right, maintaining that traditional decentralization on the peninsula. Most of these states were under Austrian domination. Um, others were ruled by reactionary conservative governments or by the Pope directly. The, now, the Carbonari were an informal network, was an informal network of secret revolutionary societies that were really active in northern Italy from about 1800 to 1831. The Carbonari conspired and planned for revolution uh, as they had very patriotic and liberal goals. So again, we see that influence of liberalism and nationalism. Now, this particular revolt began when the Carbonari joined forces with soldiers from the Kingdom of Naples in southern Italy. Um, they got together and they demanded a liberal constitution in Naples. And this revolutionary energy, these uprisings, would eventually spread north to the region of Piedmont in northern Italy. Piedmont, remember, is spelled P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T. It basically means foothills because it's the foothills of the Alps. Um, so there was protest against um, Ferdinand I, who was the king of uh, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which is essentially the region of Naples in southern Italy. Um, there were protests even against the monarchy in Piedmont, but because this was so soon after the Congress of Vienna, we will see the principle of intervention at work, right? So this is a great example of the principle of intervention because Austria was able to recruit both Prussia and Russia to crush these rebellions in Naples and Piedmont by the end of 1821. And the Pope, who was also on Team Conservative, um, went ahead and excommunicated all the members of the Carbonari for their participation in this uprising. Spain also will see some rebellions in the 1820s. Uh, we talked a little bit about this already, but I think it deserves um, some more time and attention. So when Napoleon uh, invaded Spain, he deposed the Spanish monarchy. Um, and then during the uh, last of the Napoleonic Wars, the Spanish monarchy was restored. And Ferdinand VII was restored as the king of Spain in 1813. He, of course, was a member of their traditional Bourbon monarchy. Um, after his restoration, Ferdinand VII became a reactionary conservative. Uh, he restored traditional institutions, right? So he favored the monarchy, the nobility, and the church. He also implemented heavy censorship, which meant that he only allowed two newspapers in the entire country, and he also banned all foreign books from being imported into Spain. So this conservatism is ultimately what inspired a, rebel, a liberal revolution in 1820 that was led by some army officers 
members of the bourgeoisie, and also some liberal intellectuals who were successful in temporarily deposing Ferdinand as king. But as you might remember, the rebellion was then crushed by France, who, under the direction of the Concert of Europe, used the principle of intervention to invade Spain, stop the rebellion, and restore the monarchy. And then the leaders of the rebellion were tortured and executed. Now, Ferdinand VII, in the long run, is actually considered to be one of the worst kings in Spanish history, right? First of all, he's viewed as sort of this conservative tyrant uh, who suppressed liberalism and nationalism. Uh, he's also considered to be a very ineffective, vain ruler. Um, he also uh, lost all of the Spanish colonies in the Americas, and his uh, leadership was so ineffective and chaotic that Spain would descend into civil war after Ferdinand VII died in 1833. So Spain does not have a very stable um, period in the 19th century, but then again, most European states, states don't. Moving on now to the Greek Revolution. So the Greek Revolution actually was the one successful revolution that took place in the 1820s. So the Greek Revolution was a successful revolution of the Greek people against the Ottoman Turks. And the Ottoman Turks had actually controlled Greece since the 15th century, so for over 400 years, almost 500 years. But despite those centuries of oppression, the Greeks were able to maintain a cultural identity through their customs, through their language, and through the Greek Orthodox religion. So they were not assimilated into Turkish culture. One of the um, issues that prompted the Greek Revolution beyond the Greeks just wanting sovereignty and independence was what we'll call the Eastern question, question in European politics. So that's the Eastern question. The Eastern question that began to emerge in European politics in the 19th century was the question of which European countries would fill the void in the Balkans resulting from the decline of the Ottoman Empire, right? So as the Ottoman Empire declines and becomes weaker in the 19th century, who will benefit? Now, obviously, Greek, Greece wants their independence. They want to be a sovereign state. But there are many other countries eyeing the Balkans for some potential opportuni opportunity, uh, especially Austria, Russia, even England, right? But this is also why some of those other European countries um, joined the Greek Revolution, right, to defeat the, the, Turk the Ottoman Turks, right? So specifically, it was England, France, and Russia that were encouraged to join the Greek Revolution, um, create a military alliance that would defeat the Turks and the Egyptians as well, who were fighting in this battle. Um, of course, this was also seen as a more valid revolution because we have the Christian Greeks fighting against the, the Muslim Ottomans, Right, so many Europeans felt more sympathetic for the Greeks and their cause. Um, also, the Greek Revolution um, reminded people of the culture of classical Greece, and so the Greek Revolution um, sort of inspired some nostalgia and some, uh, some historical fascination with classical Greek culture, because, of course, Classical Greece is considered to be the birthplace of Western civilization. So the Greek Revolution ended in 1829 with the Treaty of Adrianople. And I will spell that for you. The Treaty of Adrianople. A-D-R-I-A-N-O-P-L-E. Adrianople. This treaty recognized Greek independence after the Turks were defeated in a war. So that means that 
the other states of Europe recognized that Greece was now this independent, sovereign country. And really what's significant about this revolution is not only is it really the first successful revolution that was truly motivated by nationalism, right, because this is an example of self-determination. It is motivated by nationalism more than anything. But it also starts to demonstrate that some of the members of the Concert of Europe, like Britain, France, and Russia, are willing to support nationalism, right? And this signals a gradual shift away from the united conservative front that Metternich had established in the Congress of Vienna to more nationalistic self-interest, which, like I said, will really come to define conservatism in the later half of the 19th century. Now, there's also a whole, a whole flurry of revolutions that also take place in the 1820s and on the other side of the world, in the Western Hemisphere. And almost all of these are successful revolutions. So just a quick overview. You're unlikely to see this on any major exam. However, um, I do feel that this is some important contextualization, uh, especially since these revolutions are largely inspired by the events we have been studying with the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution. So first was the Haitian Revolution. Uh, Haiti is this island right here, that yellow island. It was actually called Saint Domingue. Um, and it was a French colony that was very, very wealthy. Uh, this slave rebellion was led by a freed um, uh, black man named Toussaint L'Overture. And this successful slave rebellion led to the first independent black republic in the Western Hemisphere. Um, they were able to successfully expel the French, even after Napoleon sent part of the navy over. And they are the first uh, region in the Western Hemisphere after the United States to become independent. And the first region that, again, um, was really a slave rebellion, a minority rebellion. Now, in the long run, it is unfortunate that Haiti does not become a more successful or prominent state. Um, over time, it is plagued by a weak economy by political corruption and violence. Uh, today, that island is actually divided in half so that Haiti sits on the western half of the island and the Dominican Republic sits on the eastern half. And there is um, a significant economic difference in, and also political difference in the stability of these two countries. But regardless, the long-term effect of the, uh, of, of the Haitian Revolution is that it created a fear of slave rebellions in other American colonies. And so that maybe prompted uh, some of these other rebellions in Latin America that would be led by the bourgeoisie instead of slaves. So the Latin American revolutions were led by a group called the Creoles. Uh, the Creoles were essentially uh, descendants from Europe, right? So they, they, they were, for all intents and purposes, Europeans who had settled in Latin America and, of course, the descendants of those European Europeans. They tended to be the ruling class, right? They were wealthy and powerful plantation owners. They were also well-read in lots of Enlightenment philosophy, right? They knew about the American Revolution, the French Revolution. They had read uh, Locke and Montesquieu and Voltaire and all of those great Enlightenment philosophers, but they were also skeptical of any real social reform, right, because they wanted to preserve their own power and their own privilege, and of course they were fearful of a slave rebellion like we saw in Haiti. But it is this group, the Creoles, that would lead the independence movements in Latin America, and Napoleon actually played a major role in these, appendance, in these independence movements. Because when Napoleon invaded Spain and then Portugal in 1807, it obviously uh, deposed those monarchies. It disrupted 
um, their control over the Latin American colonies and ultimately opened the door for these independence movements. So um, Spanish South America saw sort of two waves of independence movements. Um, the, the, the most important revolutionary leader for South America was actually a man named Simon Bolivar. Simon Bolivar. So Simon is spelled S-I-M-O-N, and Bolivar is B-O-L-I-V-A-R. And he was a wealthy uh, Creole military officer, right? So he's from that sort of privileged group. And he is going to raise significant popular support between 1817 and 1822, where he will win a series of military victories against the Spanish in the northern part of South America, specifically in uh, Colombia first, which is where he was from. Simon Bolivar is very much like a George Washington type figure in Colombia, right? He is a national hero. But he wins independence for uh, Colombia here, for Venezuela, um, for uh, Ecuador, right down here, uh, and um, eventually even Peru and Bolivia, so more of those northern states. Guiana was actually ruled by the French, so that's uh, a different um, process. Okay, so Simon Bolivar, huge nationalist hero for the northern states in South America. Now, in southern South America, down here by Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and even Patagonia, which would later be combined with um, Argentina, uh, these revolutions were led by uh, another nationalist hero, a man named Jose de San Martin. Jose de San Martin, who rose to power in this region of Chile and Argentina and successfully pushed Spanish troops out of southern South America. So, by 1825, all of Spanish South America had actually gained its independence. Brazil, however, is a very different story. Because Brazil is, of course, Portuguese. And actually, when Napoleon invaded Portugal, the Portuguese family fled to Brazil and stayed there in exile. While they were there, the Portuguese king, uh, Pedro, King Pedro I, took the initiative to declare Brazil an independent country. However, it was still a monarchy, but it did have some liberal principles and a constitution. Um, now, King Pedro I would actually have to abdicate as the king of Brazil in favor of his five-year-old son, right? So his son basically became the king of Brazil, especially when Pedro was able to return to Portugal. Um, and his five-year-old son, whose name I can't remember at the moment, uh, ruled Brazil until he was overthrown in 1889 by Republicans. And that's what would lead to the creation of a Republican state in Brazil. And this also coincides with the emancipation of slaves in Brazil, because Brazil was actually the very last state um, to uh, abolish slavery. And then moving up to Central America, uh, we have Mexico. Mexico is the most significant state in Central America in this period. So the Mexican Revolution began in 1810 um, when a priest named Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla rallied the Amerindians, Indians, meaning he rallied more of the native peoples to oppose the Spanish and the wealthy Creoles, right? So this is not the traditional path towards revolution that we saw in South America. Now, Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla was captured and executed in 1811 for trying to raise this popular native rebellion, but his movement continued. Uh, there's a lot more to the Mexican Revolution, and I can't do it justice here. So to make a long story short, Mexico would eventually achieve independence in 1821, 
right? So around the same time as the other states in uh, South America. But kind of like Haiti, uh, Mexico experienced lots of violence, lots of turnover in leadership, and this ultimately created an, at uh, an atmosphere of political instability. Uh, there's going to be several military coups uh, throughout Mexico's history. There's going to be lots of corruption. And unfortunately, this has characterized uh, Mexican government well into the 20th century, um, kind of like, like Italy. We know Italy is, is a very corrupt, unstable government well throughout its, uh, its unification and its history. Uh, and Mexico is kind of like the Italy of, of Latin America. Anyways, let's move on now to the big stuff, the revolutions of 1830. So this is the first big round of revolutions um, that take place in Europe after the, French, after, after the initial French Revolution, right? So big revolutions that will sweep many different countries, uh, sweep across many different countries in uh, Europe. So in France, it begins with what we call the July Revolution. Now, here is an important saying in European history. When France sneezes, Europe catches a cold. So that means when France has a revolution, especially in the 19th century, it will influence um, similar political movements across uh, much of the continent, right? So we'll see that in 1830 and in 1848. So in 1830, we call this the July Revolution because it began in July. So you might remember that Charles X was the very, very conservative Bourbon King of France. He had wanted to reimpose absolutism by getting rid of the constitutional monarchy, right? So he is full, trying to go full old regime here. And he also, is, in, in, in dissolving this constitutional monarchy, he also issued something called the July Ordinances. All right, so the July Ordinances were essentially a set of edicts that imposed rigid censorship, right? They dissolved the legislature. They got rid of this constitutional monarchy and severely reduced the electorate, which were the, the people who could have a measure of sovereignty. And so in true French fashion, this inspired a radical revolt, revolt in Paris, uh, where barricades are erected all across the city of Paris. So barricades are like big piles of furniture and trash and objects to, to shut down the city, basically. Um, so on this, in this painting here, um, you can sort of see the, the basis of a barricade in the midst of this conflict. And so this forced the conservative Charles X to abdicate his throne uh, because he knew how this would end up. And he decided that he actually wanted to keep his head attached to the rest of his body. So he abdicated. He fled to, to, to England. Um, and France would, was finally able to rid themselves of their conservative king. Uh, now, the painting you see here, while it depicts the 1830 uh, revolution, it is not the most famous painting of this period. If we go all the way back to our first slide here. You likely recognize this painting here. We've talked about it several times. It is called Lady Liberty Leading the People, Eugene de la Croix's, uh, Eugene de la Croix's most famous painting of the Romantic era. It shows the unification of these social classes, right? The workers, the bourgeoisie, um, coming together to overthrow the conservative Charles X. So it embodies that nationalism, that liberalism, that unity, that hope that we see in the, um, in the beginning of the uh, 1830 revolution. So Charles X is going to be replaced by Louis Philippe. Uh, Louis Philippe had actually been a cousin of Charles X, so he was still uh, technically part of the Bourbon monarchy, and he held the title the Duke of Orleans, so he had been a member of the royal family. And he was invited by a provisional government of liberals to rule under a constitutional monarchy. 
which he gladly accepted, right? So there's a lot of hope and optimism. We got rid of the conservative king. We now have a more modern liberal king, but it turns out that Louis Philippe really only favored the bourgeoisie, right? So his constitutional monarchy did not really extend suffrage or representation to any part of the working class. Um, this is why he is sometimes called the citizen king, if we're speaking about him in a sort of nicer tone. But more commonly, he's referred to as the bourgeois monarch or the bourgeois king, which means he was a king for the bourgeoisie. So this means that France is now controlled by the bourgeoisie, right? The upper middle class, the bankers, the businessmen. And in effect, this is a return to the very narrow liberalism of France in 1815. Right, so there really was no significant gain for the working class. Like, yeah, you got rid of the conservative Charles X, that's great, but there really isn't any reward for the working class um, for their support in this revolution. So as you can imagine, the working class is frustrated, right? They're angry. So throughout the 1830s and 1840s, there continues to be significant worker unrest in France, especially in Paris. Uh, mark, this, this unrest is marked by sporadic rebellions, including the June Rebellion of 1832, right? The Parisian uh, working class was very disappointed they had, because even though they had helped with the revolution, they were now completely excluded from political power. And this industrial working class grew significantly in the 1830s and 1840s. So the reason I mentioned the June Rebellion of 1832 is not because it is like this huge turning point or the seminal event in French history, but because the June Rebellion is actually the inspiration for Les Miserables. Um, and I may show you a clip from this moment in the movie from Les Miserables later this week. But yes, if you've seen the movie Les Miserables or you're familiar with the show, this is what all the political action is about, is that June Rebellion of 1832. So again, it's not about the French Revolution of 1789. It's not even directly about the French Revolution of 1830, but it, it does demonstrate the political reaction and, and effects of that 1830 revolution. Now, um, the revolution in France, as I mentioned, will inspire rebellions in other countries. This is where we get that phrase, when France sneezes, Europe catches a cold. So let's move down south to Italy. Um, early Italian liberalism and nationalism, frankly, is, is largely defined by the efforts of Giuseppe Mazzini. Uh, Giuseppe Mazzini was an Italian revolutionary. Uh, he wanted to create a united Italy that was free from foreign interference. And so Young Italy was his secret revolutionary society designed to achieve just that. And so these efforts um, for, uh, to achieve Italian unification, right? The liberalism, the nationalism, this energy uh, against the conservative status quo is actually referred to as the Risorgimento in Italian history. This means the Italian resurgence, right? So Mazzini and all this opposition to the conservative status quo, that's what we call this, this movement, this cultural movement of the Risorgimento. Now, Giuseppe Mazzini... Um, became a very popular uh, sort of nationalist hero, uh, despite his moderate success or lack, or even quite frankly, lack, lack of success. Um, other secret revolutionary groups like the Carbonari joined with him. Uh, many women in Italy also supported this movement, right? So um, the Risorgimento uh, is manifested in these political rebellions of 1831, 1832, that were mostly in northern Italy, specifically the regions of Modena, Parma, and even the Papal States. 
As I said, these uh, revolutions were inspired by France's relatively successful revolution. Um, you know, these were popular uprisings. Uh, the Pope even had to briefly flee Rome uh, during these rebellions. However, it was short-lived as uh, Metternich used the principle of intervention to send Austrian troops to crush this, uh, these revolutions, which, frankly, were also very disorganized. There was not a lot of unity. They were very sporadic and disorganized. And so Metternich used the principle of intervention to stop these rebellions. Um, Mazzini then had to live in exile, right? So he, it was too dangerous for him to stay in Italy. For a while, he lived in Switzerland and then, and then Britain as well. But he continued to encourage nationalist and uh, liberal movements in Italy. So he continued that spirit of the Risorgimento even from abroad. So this uh, revolution in Italy was largely a failure. Moving on to Belgium. So Belgium will actually achieve independence from the Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1830. This is one of the few successful revolutions. So you might remember that the region we know as Belgium today um, had been merged with the Dutch in 1814 to form the Kingdom of the Netherlands, right? This was one of the uh, buffer states that the Congress of Vienna had created as they redrew the map of Europe. But this was not a natural merger because Belgium had a, a different language, it had a different religion, it had a different culture, and frankly, a very different economic life. And so the Belgians did not enjoy being ruled by a Dutch monarchy. And so the uh, French July Revolution, in turn, inspired a revolt in, in Belgium against Dutch rule, specifically in the city of Brussels. Uh, this, was, this revolt was led by students and industrial workers, so it was very much a, a popular revolt. And the Dutch army actually was defeated in this rebellion, and they were forced to withdraw completely from Belgium. Um, one of the reasons that there was no principle of intervention to stop Belgium is because, quite frankly, all the other great powers were distracted, right? France had its own revolution. Um, Prussia and Russia were not really in a good position to intervene in Belgium. They were also helping Austria manage Italy. They probably had their own uh, political tension to deal with as well. So Belgium was kind of able to use this chaos, this political chaos across the continent to uh, slip through and, 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 and sneak out this independence movement. So um, after they defeat the Dutch army, uh, a national congress in Belgium would write a liberal constitution for the country, which established a constitutional monarchy under the first king, Leopold I. Leopold I, who was actually, um, had a lot uh, more of a, a German prince, I think. All right. Well, Belgian independence was acknowledged in 1830, right? They were allowed to get away with this um, mostly because they promised to remain totally neutral, right? They said, it's okay, Metternich, we're going to stay neutral. We're not going to cause any problems, right? We're not like France. We're just going to be a quiet, complacent little constitutional monarchy. So their independence was initially acknowledged and then formally recognized later in 1839 in the Treaty of London, right, where basically all the great powers together acknowledged uh, the, um, the independence and the neutrality of Belgium. Not surprisingly, the Netherlands under the House of Orange were not supportive of this development. But other than France, they were the only other successful revolution in 1830. And we might even argue that they were more successful than the French Revolution. And then the last revolution of this period is what we'll call the Polish Rebellion. 
This is also sometimes known as the November Uprising or the Polish-Russian War, as it was essentially an armed rebellion in Poland against the Russian Empire. Like all the other events we have discussed, it was inspired by the revolutions in France and also in Belgium, but it was also provoked by a Russian plan to use Polish troops to crush these other revolutions, right? So, so Russia had actually planned to use its army and part of Poland's army to stop these revolutions. Um, and again, this is also why Russia did not deal with anything uh, going on in France and Belgium, because now they had to deal with this Polish uh, rebellion. And this rebellion was, not surprisingly, totally crushed by Nicholas I, the super conservative czar, and his Russian army. And Poland lost even more autonomy, not that it had much to begin with, but basically Russia now argued that Poland was an integral part of the Russian Empire and had to be directly under Russian control. Now, England was actually one of the only prominent regions in Europe to escape any type of revolution in the 19th century. And this is because of their notable reform efforts in the 19th century. So beginning in the 1820s, um, there is some gradual liberalization of the government. Um, even within the Tory party, the conservative party, there were some young, more reform-minded political leaders, um, notably Robert Peel, uh, Robert Peel, P-E-E-L. He later becomes a famous prime minister of Britain. Um, but he and, and, and others like him had begun to gain influence in Parliament in the 1820s. And they actually started to ally with the more liberal uh, factions, right, the Whigs, um, to encourage reform in Great Britain. Now, one um, notable reform was, was even when Britain decided to abandon the Concert of Europe in 1822, right? Uh, Europe abandoned, uh, or England, I should say, abandoned uh, the Concert of Europe because they objected to the principle of intervention. So that in and of itself is a notable reform. Uh, but also the 1820s saw prison reform. Uh, it saw criminal code reform. Uh, they even allowed membership in some labor unions, although la labor unions were still largely disenfranchised. They did not have nearly as much power as they do later in the century. Um, and also um, uh, police forces were established in many of the new industrial uh, uh, cities across England. Um, the, these police were called bobbies. That's like sort of the British slang for the police or the bobbies. There was also a few notable religious reforms. For example, the Test Act of 17, I'm sorry, the Test Act of 1673 was repealed. You might remember or not that the Test Act had banned non-Anglicans from office, right? It was really directed at Catholics during that uh, period of religious tension in the 17th century, especially following the English Civil War. Uh, so it banned Anglicans and also um, um, other uh, Protestant groups like the Puritans from holding office. So that, that law was repealed. And also a new law called the Catholic Emancipation Act. So that's the Catholic Emancipation Act was created in 1829. And this law granted full civil rights to Roman Catholics in England. That's a long time coming. By 1830, the Whigs, uh, the more liberal political group, were in power. They had the majority in Parliament. Um, again, this was somewhat inspired by the July Revolution in France. Um, even though England did not see a revolution on the scale of what we're witnessing on the continent, 
it still encouraged political change. In fact, in 1830, George IV, um, the King of England, a, a relatively new King of England, asked the leader of the Whig Party, whose name was Earl Grey, and yes, that's where the, the name of the tea comes from, Earl Grey tea, but the leader of the Whig Party, Earl Grey, was directed by the new King George IV to form a new government, right? Um, that basically means to uh, create a new parliamentary majority. It's not like they're going to create a whole new system of government. Um, one of the biggest issues that Britain had to deal with was the fact that the industrial middle class felt excluded from political power in Great Britain. Um, that was one of the biggest political reforms that was necessary. And the Whigs, as the Liberal Party, favored reform instead of revolution. And they began to realize that um, unless they made some reforms and unless they um, listened to some of those demands of the industrial middle class, England might very well be headed towards a revolution. So that leads me to the Reform Bill of 1832. This is considered a milestone in British history, a very, very important step um, in British history. And it represents the political response to the significant changes that we are seeing in British life and politics, right? So this was somewhat inspired by the French Revolution and, uh, and you know, the sort of reform and spirit of change sweeping Europe. Uh, it was a response to the changing realities of Britain and the changing demographics, but it also was actually encouraged by a recent cholera epidemic. So cholera uh, was a contagious disease um, caused by um, unsanitary living conditions. And of course, this cholera epidemic was rampant among the working class in the cities. Um, and as a result, people in Britain demanded a more responsive government. So the Reform Bill of 1832 did things such as um, it increased the electorate. Uh, it may not seem like a big deal, but it increased the number of voters from 6% of the population to 12%. So it doubled the number of voters in Britain. Um, it also eliminated some of these underpopulated rural electoral districts, basically little fiefdoms uh, ruled by members of the nobility. These were sometimes called rotten boroughs. And these electoral districts had been convenient for nobility to gain support in the House of Lords, right? So it gets rid of sort of these meaningless uh, electoral districts. Uh, and replaces them with representation from new manufacturing districts and cities, all right? So those uh, cities like Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, Birmingham, those industrial cities that had emerged in the industrial heartland, the Midlands, those cities now finally had true representation in Parliament. And the result of this is that the House of Commons would become more powerful than the House of Lords in the British, uh, in the British government, in Parliament, right? So this was one of the things that contributed to essentially the weakening of the House of Lords in British history. Now, even though these are significant reforms, they still primarily benefited only the upper middle class, right? Essentially the bourgeoisie. But as we know in traditional liberalism, that is what the middle class wanted. They wanted to be connected to the ruling classes, right? They wanted a measure of sovereignty. They wanted to be able to vote. They wanted to be able to be represented in parliament. And so they were happy. Um, but many other groups in society, like the lower middle class and the working class, still had no voice. So even though the Reform Bill of 1832 is considered a milestone in British history, it is also a temporary relief, and we will need to see more development of the uh, reform of, of, of liberal reforms in Britain before the century is over.
That brings me to another interesting and also somewhat controversial uh, law passed by Parliament in the 1830s, and this is the Poor Law of 1834. The Poor Law was a series of labor reforms, um, like the Factory Acts and the abolition of slavery. These labor reforms uh, were significant um, pieces of legislation passed in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, and the Poor Law was actually based on the theory, so it's, first of all, it's strongly influenced by Thomas Malthus, so that will uh, give you a, a, an indication of what direction this is headed in. But the Poor Law was based on the theory that giving aid to the poor and giving aid to the unemployed only encouraged laziness and it actually increased the number of poor. So again, it was based on the theory that giving aid to the poor and uh, the unemployed actually encouraged laziness and increased the number of the poor. So the poor law tried to remedy this extensive poverty by essentially making poverty as awful as possible, right? Um, thinking that if the government denied any assistance to the poor, right, um, and it, it made it as difficult as possible to be poor, well then it would encourage people to not be poor, right? Specifically the unemployed. Um, if the unemployed did not receive any handouts or support, then they would choose to go to work. So the poor law really believed that poverty, like I've said before, was a choice. So uh, the poor law provided for uh, workhouses, um, you know, kind of like homeless shelters and and uh, places for uh, the the unemployed to maybe find work. But the workhouses deliberately had these terrible living conditions, right? Horrific living conditions, um, really not any legitimate support um, in, in many ways. And again, this was deliberate because they hoped that the people in the workhouses would be driven to go find work so that they, the government didn't have to support them. This is part of the long-standing bias against the poor that we see in Western civilization and Western culture. Um, this belief that people choose to be poor or if they're poor, they deserve to be poor. Um, this uh, type of poor law is replicated in other countries and it is even still seen in some of the political beliefs of certain groups in the United States, right? That's where that's why there's a lot of opposition to uh, government services, uh, even here in the modern United States. It's sort of part of that sa same theme of the poor law. All right, perhaps the most important uh, piece of uh, legislation, the most important reform that the British government passes is actually the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. Now, I believe that this is the most important piece of legislative reform because this is what would prevent a revolution in Britain. Now, you might remember that the Corn Laws were one of the most, you know, uh, one of the most uh, dis, uh, egregious laws in how it benefited the rich at the expense of the poor, right? It, it, it benefited the rich at the expense of the poor. It banned foreign grain so that British landowners would make a profit. So this led to lots and lots of opposition in Britain. Uh, there is even a, a formal political action group, right? Uh, we'll call it the Anti-Corn Law League right, that had propaganda and meetings um, to, to, to rally against the Corn Laws, right. Um, the Anti-Corn Law lead argued for lower food prices. Uh, they tried to help workers, you know, uh, acquire food. Um, and so there's, there's, the Anti-Corn Law League specifically was uh, trying to advocate for the working class, but also the Anti-Corn Law League um, and the, abol and the uh, abolishment of the Corn Laws 
would also favor the industrial middle class. And this is because uh, economic liberalism, which we associate with the middle class, favored a free market. And the corn laws were, uh, were not supportive of economic liberalism. Now, the um, repeal of the Corn Laws was also partly a reaction to the Irish potato famine of the 1840s, which I'll discuss on the next slide here. Um, and that was a, a, a famine, a crisis, uh, just right next door in Ireland. And so there was some concern that uh, about food availability in England, should England be subjected to a similar um, crisis. Right. And um, the repeal of the Corn Laws satisfied the middle class. It satisfied the working class, right, because they were able to afford to eat. And it also very likely helped England avoid a revolution in 18, uh, 1848, when almost every other major state in Europe will experience a revolution. Now, these liberal reforms are also part of what we refer to as the Victorian era in British history. The Victorian era is, def is definitely one of the sort of golden ages of British history. It coincides with the reign of Queen Victoria, who ruled England from 1837. She became queen when she was only 18 years old. And she ruled for the remainder of the century until she died in 1801. And Queen Victoria was a very popular monarch. She was considered um, a national symbol for the British. And her, uh, her reign is, is defined as a period of peace and prosperity, right? The Victorian era is associated with peace and prosperity. It's this golden age of Britain. Um, where Britain expands its empire, Britain, you know, um, has uh, successful industrialization, it's making a lot of money, but also this is an era defined by higher moral standards and a strong religious drive and also significant reform, political reform, social reform, and economic reform. And so we'll see many more examples of the Victorian era um, throughout the rest of this century. However, we do need to discuss one of the more unfortunate um, episodes associated with British history, and that is the Irish potato famine. So um, this requires us to do a little bit of review about the relationship between Ireland and Britain. Um, Ireland had been exploited and oppressed by Great Britain for centuries, going back to the 16th century and the rule of Henry VIII. Um, Cromwell, of course, is known for his um, atrocities in Ireland and his abuse of the Irish Catholics. And there was, frankly, this, this permanent division, right? The Irish Catholics would be oppressed by the English Protestant landlords who were given most of the land in Ireland. So um, in 1801, the British Parliament passed the Act of Union, yet another Act of Union. And this officially made Ireland part of the United Kingdom and prevented any self-rule in Ireland. So up to this point, Ireland was, was controlled by Britain, but it was more of like a colony, right? But the Act of Union in 1801 made it a formal part of the United Kingdom, like Wales and Scotland. But Ireland actually proved to be much more difficult to govern than some of these other regions. Uh, because of a, quote, starving population, an absentee aristocracy, an alien established Protestant church, and the weakest executive in the world. This is how Benjamin Disraeli, a famous British prime minister, uh, described Ireland. So um, again, to just to, ref to refresh uh, the context here, the Irish Catholics were extremely poor, 
Um, they worked on land owned by the British aristocracy, and the Irish Catholics had very limited rights, right? They were not allowed to own land. They were not allowed to vote. They could not hold political office. They could not live near a major town. They could not get an education. They were not even allowed to pursue a profession. So they were legally and deliberately severely oppressed by the British for much of this, um, these past few centuries. Now, throughout the 19th century, some of these laws would be overturned and um, uh, realized as being really, really unequal and, and, and unjust, basically. Um, but even so, the, 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 the fact that these laws existed in the first place shows us the, the deep animosity and the disdain that the Irish Catholics had for the British and also the animosity and disdain that the British had towards Irish Catholics, right? So the British viewed Irish Catholics as like second class human beings, right? They were not equals. And of course, because of this laws and because of this discrimination and this oppression, the Irish Catholics hated, hated the British with every fiber of their being. Um, so, let's talk about what actually caused this potato famine. So the potato, which was a new world product, had been introduced to Ireland in the 18th century. And because the potato was very useful, right? It was easy to grow. It had a high caloric value. By the mid 19th century, most of the Irish poor were entirely dependent on the potato for their survival. Uh, the most common type of, of meal, quite frankly, was a combination of boiled potatoes and um, this type of plant in Ireland, in, in Ireland. I can't remember the name of it, but it's basically like a cross between kale and seaweed. But the, cal but the potato gave the Irish enough calories to survive, and the, uh, the green plant, the seaweed kale, basically gave them um, more of the vitamins that they would need to survive. But only a few types of potato were grown in Ireland at this time, which is going to be an issue when we get to the, the famine. Um, also, uh, there had recently been a population boom in Ireland. Uh, early, uh, Ireland was known for having early marriages, right? Uh, Catholic, the, the sort of Catholic culture of Ireland encouraged early marriages, it encouraged large families, and so this led to significant population growth in the 18th and 19th centuries, where the vast majority of the population were still very, very poor. So most of these Irish Catholic peasants lived in absolutely desperate poverty. So these are the conditions uh, that exist in Ireland when the potato famine hit. So in the summer of 1845, a fungus um, destroyed the potato crop. This is sometimes called the blight, B-L-I-G-H-T, the, the potato blight. And this fungus destroyed almost all the potato crops in Ireland for the next several years, right? And because Ireland had a limited um, uh, supply of like what type of potato it grew, um, that uh, sort of narrow uh, potato diversity is what led to the, uh, this extreme, um, uh, the extreme effects of the fungus and the blight. And wet weather uh, in Ireland supported the spread of this fungus across, across the island, across the, the island of Ireland. Um, and so what, so these potatoes basically became rotten and black and completely inedible. So this is what led to the massive starvation across Ireland, which was really quite tragic, and also the diaspora of the Irish people. During this four to five year period, about one million Irish Catholic peasants died from starvation. Another two million immigrated and left Ireland. Many of them came to the U.S. and to Great Britain. 
Um, and one of the, uh, the reasons this is, is seen as such a horrific event in, in human history, especially relatively modern human history, is because the famine really could have been solved. Like the British government could have shipped grain and other food and resources to the people of Ireland. But they didn't because they were essentially racist, right, and, dis and, and discriminatory towards the Irish people. Um, and the, uh, the, the, corn uh, the corn laws also inhibited the um, exportation of British grain. So it was Britain's political pro uh, policies that also made this such a horrific event. And, of course, that contributes to why the Irish hate, 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 hate the British, and it also did not reflect well on Britain um, on the international stage. So obviously this led to severe population decline. In fact, the Irish population continued to decline throughout the remainder of the century due to lower birth rates, higher death rates. In fact, it was the only country in Europe to experience population decline in the 19th century. And by the time Ireland actually achieved independence from Britain, because that will happen in the early uh, 20th century in 1921, their population was only half of what it had been in the 1840s. And even to this day, there are more people of Irish descent living outside of Ireland rather than in Ireland. I think when I was in Ireland in 2017, the population was still only about 4 million people. Compare that to the Phoenix metropolitan area, which has about 6 million people. So Ireland's a beautiful country. Apparently there's a lot of land there. The people are very friendly. Um, it's very green, but it's also very cold and wet. And I'm pretty sure they have solved all their issues with potatoes. So if you're looking for a place to move to, um, Ireland might be something to consider. But for now, we're going to uh, pause for this second part of the lecture, and we will return with the third and final part of this lecture on the revolutions of 1848.